Thank you. Well, hello again, everyone. Nice to see you today. Welcome to today's dialogue. It's sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And today we're talking on building the progressive tidal wave in the 2022 elections. My name is Mackenzie Wilson. My pronouns are they, them. My work is in the abolition movement, whether that is the abolition of private property or law enforcement. But you can find me here in Sacramento, California, on unceded Nisanan, Miwok, and Maidu, and, uh, Maidu land. Uh, and I work with organizations like Decarcerate Sacramento and the Sacramento Tillman's Union. My other co uh, moderator today is Maria Elena Martinez who joined LERNA, which is League of Revolutionaries for a New America, almost three decades ago. She has been active in the massive immigrant rights mobilizations and mega marches in, 20, er, in 2006, and was involved in the student movement for Chicanx studies at UCLA. Currently, she is a member of the Tri-National Coalition in Defense of Public Education, Association of Raza Educators in Los Angeles, and AFT 152 Los Angeles College Faculty Guild. As a journalist, she has reported from the Border Social Forum, from the Social Forum in Atlanta, the World Social Forum in Venezuela. A parent and an educator in Los Angeles, Maria Elena has written about charter schools, housing, and immigration. Today, we would like to encourage you to put your pronouns in your profile as a participant. Gender and sexual liberation is a part of our work to free society from the cis heteropatriarchy, which is deeply intertwined with white supremacy and other forms of oppression. When we say that we are a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, multi-everything, we are also a multi-gendered uh, community. And we need to make space and love for that as well. So again, please add your pronouns to your name and make it a space for everybody. We also encourage all of you to post links in the chat to your campaigns, the struggles you're in, or important organizations you're a part of to allow us to be able to share your work and your wisdom. I wanted to quickly just go over some community agreements that we request that you observe in today's dialogue. Pretty simple. Everyone's muted in the beginning, and we have to unmute ourselves to talk. We call this one mic, um, one diva, one mic, too, you know? Um, but I think we all understand that we don't want to be interrupting each other. We encourage you to put questions in the chat, and panelists will possibly have time to discuss them, time permitting. Zoom etiquette is for people to remain muted, again, whenever not talking, to keep the noise floor down. We all also understand that accidents happen. And in the spirit of political unity, please today listen without agenda. Be amazed. Practice respect and kindness. Do not mispronoun participants and make space for other voices. What is said here today should stay here, but what is learned here should leave here. Um, and if we understand that today is a mutual learning space, then I think we'll be just fine. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it to my co-moderator, Maria Elena, who will lead us in today's land acknowledgement. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you, Mac, for that, um, for getting us started. <clears throat> uh, we'd like to begin our dialogue with a land acknowledgement from across the country. We recognize the United States was, I'm sorry, I got a distracting beat there. The United States was established on stolen indigenous land um, in Sacramento. Uh, we speak from the Valley Miwok, this, the Nisenan land, and in the Midwest, we speak from the stolen land of the Chippewa, uh, Osage and Pawnee, and many other tribes who flourished in the region. I am in Southern California right now in the historic Tonga, Tonga Gabrielino, uh, Native American settlements of Southern California. This settler colonialism, which took the land and dispossessed and, and killed the indigenous people, is still the foundation of the ruling class and this uh, capitalist system. The reality of white supremacist rule is a necessary part of our conversation. 
So we will be intertwining all of these uh, systems of oppression as we continue our discussion. Okay. Thank you. I was, uh, we're going to inform that our artist who uh, today has made it into space. So if now is a good time, Charita, we would love to have you come up and speak your truth to power today. All right. Um, I'm, I'm going to read um, this piece called Lessons from the Edge. It was read earlier this year, and um, it just seems to flow in to what I've been listening to here. Lessons from the Edge. States' heads measure views, disconnects, defines, compartmentalizes. Divide lines, refines how quick they can pivot on the edge, hidden. Hidden oppressors said, nudge them, seduce them against conscious will, subliminally remove fundamentals, laws, nature. Words create a certain kind of remove, said the linguist. Trained not to think in systemic causation, said the scholar. We speak a language that picks our pocket, said the poet. Therefore, an effect can become a cause, reinforcing the original cause, producing the same effect in an intensified form, and so on, indefinitely, said Orwell. Histories sleep inside histology, skin cell walls, a radar guards, flesh, bone, mind, soul, remembers, intention, eyelids, edge, opens, wide, close, snaps, picture, book, rock, drops in sea of Blood water, rippling waves ashore, laps, maps, collective harbor. Spears open, conceives, navel to navel, new breed bears responsibility from the edge of an angle leashed in hegemony. When, how long life ends or begins. Respect fetus, damn the child, adult, insult, hunger, unhoused, trafficked, sell bodies, mass murders, condone the Fuhrer, suffer little ones that come unto me, for yours is the kingdom of guns, oil, drugs. God is no respecter of persons. The Bible tells us so in Acts 1034, US presidents swear on taking office, can't forego. Born broken, lessons from the edge. Some children want to know if they will see their own children. Reassigned gender parts. AMA, new art. Male newborns with less testosterone. Sperm count declining 1% per year. Last 50. Biochemists say by 2045, it'll be harder to conceive life. Will human reproduction survive? Ingesting GMO, plastics, electromagnetic frequencies, most important product disrupts hormone receptors deed living on the edge. 900% rise in adult use of diapers. A nation pees on itself. Scared fecalists, does this shh matter? Lessons from the edge hold two opposed views at the same time. Double think dines on contradictions, afflicts decisions, argues well against them both. Never let the right hand know what the left is doing. Own nothing, be happy. Names, labels, prescribed behaviors, walk on shattered mirrors, shards exposed, barefoot all over, opioid pain relieves. Financial gain, yes, suicide prevention and assistance, 
the end game. Cancel culture. Is this Armageddon? The rapture? Lord, do you and the landlord have a thing going on? Are these lessons from the edge, the trick or treat? The wean from the holy, the renunciation of instinct. Societies go to hell. Life allegiances fail, falls through filigreed walls, floors, laws, courts, prisons, crack, attacks. You didn't see it like this, you saw it like that. Groom alternative facts, wreck, amend, manufacture consent, defend it. Minds harvested, eyes wide open, shut, bent on edge of remembrance, internal intelligence between matter and void. What? Why social reckoning after public lynching of George Floyd? He was not the first. He has not been the last. World wars, near genocide of Native Americans, babies, children, vanished from mothers' arms at borders, homes, skin tone, judge, bar barred intelligence, indigenous land, first tongues, ranked inferior, whose manifest destiny is superior. Break barriers, lessons from the edge of insanity that declared there's no scientific proof fish need water to survive. Officials report to natives that ask how did rivers and streams dry, causing tens of thousands of fish to die, livelihoods at risk, waiting for answers, government questions, mental illness, drugs, alcohol, addictions, non-acceptance of entitled reasoning, ignores cause to contemplate the chaos, but we don't give up, forget giving up. We try angles, inject project carbon six, ride this hex till it's gone. We word work he is. We up and down, wave around, found dance, art, music, poems, speak your peace, your rod and staff synapse. Comfort we, living trees, acknowledge edge, foot, floor, fauna, feet, fin, feather, wheels. This Fibonacci seal, consistent deal with the cosmos. As above, so below, gut senses the heart. Old factory knows what it knows at the edge when exposed to decompose. We compose with arc in ways that insist our floral bouquets be the way of our table. Who bears witness at the cell, walls, edge, the door, where in every deliberation, the impact of our decisions must be made on the next seven generations. Those faces yet still beneath and above ground. Thank you. you right there? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make some short opening uh, remarks. Um, I wanted to start, you know, being here in Los Angeles about, you know, what's been in the news the last couple of weeks with these racist rants by these LA City Council members um, and the member of the Federation of Labor. Um, and I just kind of want to offer some context and the transition to uh, why it's so important that we meet um, here today. As stated earlier, we know that the pillars of this society are based on the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of Africans. We know that this is um, stolen land built with stolen labor. And so I just want to kind of with that context, we can see that when you try to change the system by adopting the ideology of that system, this is what you get. When you try to fight the enemy with the enemy's ideas, this is what you get. And that we've been here for a long time trying to fight the enemy with the enemy's ideas. And so I just want to list three ideas, maybe even uh, lies. Um, can you hear me? Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure. 
Um, okay, cool. Uh, and so these these lies, right? This I, you know, this concept of whiteness, it's a lie, it's a political construct. Um, it's a political, uh, because it has a political and an economic goal of creating this unity based on whiteness. It was created to blunt and neutralize um, the force of the majority in this country, which is, you know, white Anglo-Americans. Um, that's one lie. The other one is that there's not enough, that we simply cannot feed, clothe, or house everyone, that it's just not possible. Um, and then the third lie is that not everyone deserves all of these things anyways. And so um, a, a social base uh, for an economic system that's based on competition, on private property, on profit and private ownership has to have these lies and uh, uh, operationalize these lies against us uh, for decades now. Uh, but guess what? Our young people, our beautiful, courageous, and brave young people are leading away. They understand the assignment. They understand um, it. So it's not just this outcry for these failed leaders to resign. They want system change. And I want to quote um, Marta Escudero from uh, El Sereno here in Los Angeles. Um, she's in a group called the uh, Reclaimers and they reclaim housing. And recently at some of these um, ongoing protests against these councilmen uh, people, um, she says, we are done. Politics is a game and we are done. She goes on, don't vote for someone just because they look like you. Um, I know Black Lives Matter activists have been screaming, not all skin folk are kin folk, right? There's, there's a new movement uh, of the poor, of the dispossessed, and this movement is coalescing. And they are calling out systems, not just people. And in a recent article, and I'll put the link in the chat, uh, Professor uh, Kenyatta Yamada Taylor from Princeton, she's actually at Northwest now, she um, wrote an article in the New York Times in 2020, right after the mobilizations of uh, that summer. Um, and she titled it The End of Black Politics. And I reread it again recently, um, and it really helped me put into context. So, and I think this idea of the end of black politics can certainly be expanded to the end of, you know, brown politics or identity politics. And some of the ideas in this article, um, she highlights that, you know, this failed leadership at the top and that instead we have uh, the leadership is being provided by organizers on the ground. Um, she said, you know, they're leading this fight for basic needs like housing, education, jobs, and health care, while the status quo corporate Democrats cut deals to secure their own positions at the expense of the most vulnerable. Uh, black electoral success and brown electoral success in this count, in this case, has not translated into qualitative improvements in black lives or brown lives for that matter. She goes on to say that young people are rebelling against the strangulation of the status quo, and that this includes a stale black leadership that regularly fails to rise to the challenge confronting this generation, which refuses to accept the symbolism of black leadership without its professed rewards. Black elected officials have become adept at mobilizing the tropes of black identity without any of its political content. And again, I want to expand this to include, you know, um, brown elected officials uh, and identity um, politics in general. The struggle for basic needs is growing, and it is growing into a political force that the ruling class is preparing to deal with. They will weaponize those lies that I mentioned earlier to get us to fight each other, and this time to the death. The Trump movement shows how effective they can be when they concentrate their resources. Enabled by the do nothing corporate Democrats who refuse to challenge the corporate assault on society. This desperation and the history of this country are creating a dangerous situation. One where elections are challenged if the ruling class doesn't get what it wants. One where voting rights and access to voting are pushed back. So much of a fascist state is already in place. They are working on getting the support of a section of our working class. 
This is where this is what is at stake in our country right now. A full on constitutional crisis like we've not seen since the Civil War. For more on how to, on how to, to learn more about how we got here, check out the publication Rally Comrades. The articles include a historical analysis and help us understand how we got here. Today, we are here, we will hear from specific struggles for basic needs. We will hear from grassroots candidates that are standing up to corporate status quo Democrats. And more importantly, we are here to claim our rights to life, liberty, and dignity. The League of Revolutionaries for New America is dedicated to uniting the struggles the ruling class aims to divide. We cannot win without this strategy. Si se puede, let's get started. Uh, now we're gonna move into our panels. Uh, me and Maria and Elena are going to introduce and give a little uh, background to our first four, and then we'll have our first one come up. So our first one is actually, it's a pleasure for me and an honor to introduce Kenneth. Kenneth is a candidate for Los Angeles controller. He's a certified public accountant, born and raised in LA uh, by parents who immigrated from the Philippines. In 2016, he founded a, county, a community service group called We Can Make a Difference LA that provides essential supplies to unhoused communities and low-income families in Skid Row, Westlake, Koreatown, Westlake, Koreatown, and Echo Park. In 2016, he joined the LA Tenants Union, fellow Law Two member, fellow A Tune member. Love that, Kenneth. Um, and uh, organizes and fights alongside tenants experiencing immoral rent increases, unjust evictions, and uninhabitable living conditions. In 2017, he became a neighborhood council board member in Koreatown. And I think Maureen is going to talk about Michael, and then I'll come back to talk about Angelica, and we'll bring you on up, Kenneth. Yes, I want to uh, introduce also our other speaker, Michael Harrington. He's a tenant organizer in Eastern Kentucky. He's a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and, in, and active in the efforts to mobilize working class Kentucky voters to reject the proposed anti-abortion amendment to the state's constitution this November 8th. He is a lifelong Appalachian who has organized in his community on, on a variety of efforts. One of those campaigns won a local syringe exchange program in his county. He's also anchored co-anchored a uh, winning labor union drive at his workplace with uh, CMRJB Workers United. He is passionate about fighting alongside other tenants, working families, and unemployed folks in Kentucky. Welcome, Michael Harrington. Uh, and then we'll be also speaking today with Angelica, who is a candidate for Congress in District 29 in the San Fernando Valley area of Los Angeles. She was born and raised in the San Fernando Valley, is a mother of five kids, a community organizer, and served as a, as a Bernie Sanders delegate in the 2016 and 2020 Democratic conventions. She is past president of the Sun Valley Area Neighborhood Council and currently serves on numerous state Democratic Party caucuses and the LA Democratic Party Central Committee. And finally, we have a special guest from Oakland, California, who was not announced previously because we were only able to know that she was going to join us a few days ago, and that's Kitty Kelly Epstein. She is a professor and author and activist and the host of a radio show on KPFK in the Bay Area, KPFA in the Bay Area. She has written three books. The latest analyzes the 1968 strike at San Francisco State, which won ethnic studies there for the first time. She has been involved in the education uprising in Oakland that has been going on this year and can speak about the ranked choice progressive mayoral slate and highlight the Oakland Housing Ballot Initiative, ballot measures K, U, and V. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists and um, Kenneth, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, Kenneth, we'd like to start with you. Um, can you tell us why, and each panelist will have roughly eight minutes um, for this first uh, round. And we're going to ask you to please try to stay to that. Our time is limited and our speakers are so wonderful. We want to make sure we can hear 
uh, from everyone. Um, so Kenneth, can you uh, tell us why your campaign is so successful and maybe what are some of the lessons that it holds, um, not only for other candidates, but for leaders in the social movement? Awesome. Well, thank you all for having me. Thank you, uh, Marianne Mack. Um, fortunately, I have to leave at 11 and five minutes, but I could, I could talk about this um, uh, really quick, though, about, you know, our campaign. And I think, you know, the League of Revolutionaries uh, are doing amazing work. I, I spoke here last year, too. And, and I think what makes our campaign so successful is we, we don't shy away from who we are um, as revolutionaries. One of the biggest things that our opponents attack us for is they say, Kenneth Mejia claim, calls himself a revolutionary. Do you want a revolutionary in office? And then the June results came out and we won by 20% over seven people, mm -hmm. um, including a sitting um, council member. <clears throat> and I think, I think when, when, when we became so successful because we didn't back down on our issues of fighting for housing as a human right, right? or clean air as a human right. We're fighting for the most vulnerable, our, our unhoused neighbors, um, our black and brown neighbors, um, you know. And what we did really well was that we, we decided to do the job already of city controller. And the, for those who don't know, the city controller is the city's accountant and auditor. It's, it's a position on numbers. And what we did was we took city data we showed people where all the money was going. And, you know, as many of you know, most of our money goes to the police. We spend $3.2 billion here in the city of LA. Um, you know, their budget alone can fund about 30 departments in the city of LA. And we only have about 40 departments. That's how, that's how massive these things are. So I think, you know, we attribute our success to, to not shying away from being a, a revolutionary and empowering people. Um, many of our organize, organization team None of us are consultants. Like we're all literally uh, organizers, whether it's housing justice. I came from tenants rights and, and homelessness um, activism. And you know, our other people are are doing uh, movement organizing as well. And I think that's the reason, you know, why we're so easily able to connect with folks on the ground and with voters. And so, you know, don't shy away. I think it's it's really easily when I mean, you're running for office to shy away from the term being a revolutionary, because what we're doing is revolutionary. You know, the status quo of the Democratic Party in LA, as many of you saw, they're racist, they're corrupt. In the past three years, three council members have been indicted. In the past week alone, three council members have been shown as racist. And just, just we, we've had 15 city council members. So that's 15, like that's a small portion, six out of 15. Like that's a high number of, of, of bad people. And just because they have a D next to their name or because they're blue, it doesn't mean that they represent you. So, okay. so um, you know, that's my advice is don't shy away, do the job already, keep organizing. And, um, you know, don't, you don't have to pay those expensive consultants to do your campaign. So thank you. <clears throat> Bravo. Thank yes, you, brother. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, I think I want to um, introduce uh, the next speaker. And if you're staring into the screen and you see me kind of hold up two, it is not just a peace sign, it's that you've got two minutes. Okay, so maybe that'll help um, keep us on track. But it's also peace, right? Okay. Um, so um, I'd like to um, move to Michael. Um, can you please tell us about your work in the Kentucky Reproductive Rights Campaign, um, how the movement in California can help your campaign, and how your work in Kentucky impacts California? Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me, um, everybody. Um, I'll, I'll start off by um, saying a little bit about the the campaign and, and the coalition of folks who are who are um, working on um, an electoral ballot measure this year. Um, so in the state of Kentucky, um, we we know recently from the Supreme Court decision that overturned Roe versus Wade that um, the the battle for basic needs in our health care um, and, and abortion is absolutely health care. Um, that that 
uh, struggle um, is at a new moment. Um, so um, in the state of Kentucky, our lawmakers have pushed through a ballot initiative uh, to bring to voters um, that asks voters, do you want to codify in the Kentucky Constitution that nothing in this Constitution of our state will protect um, abortion? Um, the way that um, uh, a lot of folks write these um, measures is, is a little tricky. Um, and uh, the goal is Kentucky already has very strict um, abortion law, anti-abortion laws, um, already has um, a, a trigger law that has went into effect that, that organizations that pursue litigation strategies are, are trying to combat. Um, but if, if this constitutional amendment passes, it creates one more barrier um, in our campaign to win back abortion as a, as a human right, as a fundamental aspect of health care. Um, so we need to prevent that barrier from being put into place. So we're reaching out to Kentucky voters across the state um, to inform them about what's going to be on their ballot, explain what the amendment means, um, and get out the vote to, to vote no on this amendment. Um, to get a little bit uh, specific, um, I'm, I work with an organization called Showing Up for Racial Justice. Overall, that that organization wide effort, who is just one player in in the big coalition of of groups, organizations, activist organizers that are mobilizing Vote No, um, come this November, um, our. Uh, organization has made 46,000 calls to Kentucky voters um, with more than 1,000 um, live, in time, person to person, deep conversations um, pointed toward um, persuading folks to, to get out and vote no. Um, of, of that uh, effort, 79% of the people that we've talked to are already with us, um, and 25% of the folks that we've talked to started out as either no, um, I'm, I'm going to vote yes, or um, had no intention of voting at all, um, but through those conversations um, have pledged to vote no on uh, Amendment 2, which is what this, this campaign is called. Um, so many, many, many people that we're talking to don't know about Amendment 2 or understand what it means or its intention behind it. So it's been really important to have these conversations as many as we could have. The lane that I'm in is um, a lane where um, there's a group of uh, fellow working class white guys um, calling other working class white guys in, in Kentucky, especially in Eastern Kentucky, where I call home um, to, to just listen and talk to folks about where we're coming from. Um, and and hear uh, and and really get to know what's concerning um, folks like us um, to start that relationship building that we need to to transform and realize um, even though we might not be. Um, obviously uh, directly impacted by by this particular issue we actually are impacted by this issue in countless number of ways and we've got skin in this game so folks like us need to get off the bench and and into the game so that we can defeat this to protect um, all basic needs and all health care for all Kentuckians um folks outside the region um, have been able to support our work mostly through um, virtual phone banking where we provide a lot of training um, for folks who aren't familiar with the South or who who uh, might not be from this area um, are able to get skilled up, trained up on how to have high quality conversations and get to know who we are as, as Kentuckians um, to have uh, those conversations to get out the vote. Um, so uh, that's the main way that folks from outside of Kentucky have been able to support our efforts. I love it. Thank you. Get off the bench. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I would like to um, move to our next uh, speaker. Um, Angelica, we'd love to hear about how your campaign is going as well. Can you tell us a little bit about 
your campaign and some of the issues um, and the way people are responding to your campaign as well? Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Angelica Duenas. I'm running for Congress in California's 29th Congressional District. It's in Los Angeles, in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and excuse me, I'm actually um, fighting a cold. I, I've been sick for the last couple of weeks. So if I start coughing, I'll probably start. <laughs> so my apologies. But um, we are running a 100% people powered campaign out here in Los Angeles. Um, in 2020, we got really, really close. And we ran a really powerful campaign with a lot of challenges that we faced. And we did way better than anybody ever expected. We, expect, we were expected to break about 20%. We got 43.3% of the vote with less than $80,000 using a raw data CD. Yes, they still make those CD data from the LA County. And we were using Google Sheets and to cut turf and to sort our data and to target voters. Um, so with less than $80,000, we were almost able to um, unseat an, an incumbent that has been representing my community for over 25 years at every level of government. Um, he spent a million four hundred thousand dollars to hold on to his seat. So we were outspent twelve times, and we were less than seven points away from winning. So here we are again. We got over ninety-one thousand votes, and it was very um, obvious that the people in our community are looking for something better. They demand a better representation. And here in Los Angeles, if, as you may have heard, um, there's a lot of shakeup happening. We have. Um, you know, uh, incumbents being uh, beat outright, uh, outright beaten by uh, challengers, underdogs. We have uh, establishment of candidates that were put in place into second place in the primary. We have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, changes happening in Los Angeles. And most recently, as you, as Kenneth Mejia mentioned, we have three uh, city council people who have were outed as a racist. One has already resigned. Um, so there's a lot of, um, of uh, hunger for change here in Los Angeles. And so we are here representing that change, that, that hunger. I uh, live nine minutes away from the hospital where I was born. I'm born and raised here in Sun Valley, California. I'm raising my five children here. They all attend LAUSD schools. I am dedicated to my community. I, am, I, am, I have been witnessing how my community has gone from bad to worse in the last 25 plus years. And, um, you know, I've gotten tired of, 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 of complaining about it. People say I'm angry and I am, I'm very angry. And I'm tired of just screaming and complaining about it. And so we decided to come together and organize around it. I believe that we need to defend our happiness and organize our rage. And here we are giving it full force. And so our hope is that um, by, by running a campaign that where we can show that, you know, you don't need big money, you don't need, um, all these like special tools you don't need consultants like Kenneth has uh, mentioned you we can run winning campaigns and we can take power I think that we need to start focusing on on taking power and yeah, organizing okay. around it um, I think that we made a mistake in the last 20-30 years of fighting the power and not taking the power and being the power and I think that it's it's um it's 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 a waste of time to be correct and to be right um, if we don't have power behind it to make our, our policies a reality. And so, you know, in 2016, um, well, I was an, a, an independent all my voting life up until 2016, um, when I went Democrat in order to vote for Bernie Sanders, I didn't want to have any problems voting here in Los Angeles. I went green for a couple of years and I'm back to being a Democrat. Why? Well, because I want to win. And here in my district, you need to be a Democrat to win. So we need to strategize around power and we need to, you know, be realistic in our goals and our aspirations, and we need to be um, open about our the skills that we're that we're um, that we're uh, gaining along the process. So, when I'm Congresswoman, I hope to be able to share my space. I want my my office to be a community empowerment center where I will have extra space to share with community. I want to be able to hold workshops to hold uh, field trips and to uh, literally empower my community, teach them how to, how to petition government at all levels, teach them how to empower themselves and teach people how to run campaigns so that we can have the working class um, ha stand a chance against the establishment and to um, be the voice that we, we so desperately need. So here in the East San Fernando Valley, we are running a 
shoot, you know, like very, very, very small budget uh, campaign. We have raised, um, in, in, well, in 2020, I, with less than $80,000, we did what we did. We spent about 85 cents a vote. Um, so it can be done. This time around, we don't have the pandemic. So like I said, I had five kids. Four of them were students during the 2020 campaign. So I, I had to be an at-home teacher. I had to, I, I couldn't knock on doors. We couldn't do face-to-face -face events. We faced so many challenges. My dad passed away in August, which was literally right in the middle between the primary and the general. It, it was a soft story, I know. But the point being is that we face a lot of challenges, yet we did what we did. What does that mean? That means that if we, if we wouldn't have faced those challenges, that means that we would have had $20,000 more, and that means that if we would have had 20 super volunteers more, we would have won in 2020. So here we are again, and we've got, we've got, we are able to knock on doors, we're able to have these conversations, we're able to raise more money this time around because of, you know, people know who we are a little bit more, and we're able to get out there. We're here to show people, to show our, here, the, our, our fellow, um, activists here in Los Angeles and California and across the country that you don't need mega endorsements. You don't need all the big names. You know, we were able to do what people who had Bernie Sanders, AOC, our revolution, everybody in their mom in the kitchen sink were not able to do. And we did that with raw data, Google Sheets and like a sack of potatoes. You know what I'm saying? And so we don't need all of these big names. All we need is ourselves. We need to empower ourselves. And sorting data is powerful. And I'm so grateful to Kenneth Mejia, who has empowered us to learn the skills necessary. With data, it comes power. So let's learn how to work it. And so I want to encourage everybody, if you, if you know anybody out there that you can get behind of, please encourage them to run. If you already have somebody that, that is near you that's running, please support them. We can do this without you. And please consider running for office. We need to take on every single seat of power, every single one. Oh, Marie, I think you're muted. Yeah, thank you so much. That is so exciting. Um, you know, fighting the power, it's time to take the power. That's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to move on. Um, we'd love to hear from Kitty next. Um, and we'd like to know about how the people of Oakland are using the elections as a battleground to secure housing and public education. I mean, listen to this panel. This, this is really an uprising that is happening across the country. So please uh, share, us, share with us your experience in Oakland. So it is an uprising in Oakland, and I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to hear the other speakers about the struggles that they're engaged in and to be with all of you today. Uh, most people know of Oakland as a seat of progressive activism uh, for many reasons, um, but there are a couple of facts about its history you might not know. Oakland was the uh, Northern California headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan during the 1920s, and they had, you know, held burning cross burnings in the hills. And then after that, it was the complete uh, domain of Noland, who was the owner of the Oakland Tribune. There was no black representation, no brown representation. And then, as you all know, there was an influx of people coming from the South. And these were the families of people like Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, other people who created the Black Panther Party, which it, it originated in Oakland, and um, which accomplished a lot in uh, both in things like food programs and so on, and in, in getting people to feel more powerful and more activated. And so uh, since then, other people have uh, succeeded them and have had Oakland become an extremely progressive place in many, many ways. But now we are under a more major assault again, and that is by developers who see Oakland as the perfect place for them to do their development because it has the most perfect weather in the world, according to some encyclopedias. It has beautiful ocean views. And as far as the developers are concerned, it's wasted on the people who live here because we don't have enough money to pay for everything they want to, to put here. And um, the fact that it's very close to San Francisco is also important to them. And so we are under a major assault. 
And uh, we have had movements and have movements that are powerful and organized and, and thoughtful, uh, but there's so much for us to do because there's so much on the other side now. One manifestation of this is the desire by John Fisher, who owns both the Gap, uh, Old Navy, the KIPP charter school industry to take a portion of our port and build 3000 luxury units on a part of our port. And our port, of course, is the economic engine of the city. So this is a huge battle. And it's a battle at the same time about schools, which there has been a whole conspiracy to take over the Oakland School District, which started 20 years ago. And the goal of that was to change the school system so that it would be appealing to those same people that the developers are trying to move into Oakland. Because they weren't going to likely want to go to the schools that we all treasure, McClymouth High School, over the district and have been closing 20 schools. So we have a movement that is resisting all of these things and in some very powerful ways. One of the important things about the movement is managed to elect a representative by the name of Carol Fife, who has all those good qualities that people have been talking about in the earlier presentations. She is an organizer. She continues to be an organizer, although she's sitting on the city council and she has raised a number of very important issues and she's in constant contact with the people of the city. So she has done a lot and uh, she's an unusual representative. She's the person who led the Moms for Housing effort that people might've read about. Um, other features of the movement that are good at this particular moment in time, we are, in an election and two forces I've described, the, the developers and their candidates who are part of the corporate section of the Democratic Party against the people who are doing all kinds of things to try to hold on to or rest back the mayor's seat in Oakland. And one of the groups that has come together is something called the People's Progressive Ranked Choice Slate. And if people wanted to follow it on Twitter, it's at Oak Progressive. Um, the Twitter feed was just put together recently, but what we're trying to do is use ranked choice voting to get people to vote only for the progressive candidates in any order they wish, with the hope that we will be able to outdo the, uh, the um, de developers who have spent, for example, a million dollars on one of the candidates. The coal industry has spent a million dollars on one of the candidates. Maybe that's not a lot in a bigger city than Oakland, but to spend a million dollars on a candidate just for those industries shows how determined they are to try to wrest power from uh, the people of Oakland. Um, so there are also some important ballot measures. Uh, Carol Fife, the woman I mentioned, had to do with some of them. One of them, uh, which you all might want to consider doing something about yourself in California, is a law that was passed in order to enforce segregation that requires that if you want to build any affordable housing in a city, you have to have a ballot measure where people vote that they want to have those units built. And that's because, you know, the racists didn't want to have to any affordable housing. So we are, do have a ballot measure uh, on our ballot that, to, uh, that would allow the building of 13,000 units in Oakland. Um, and of course, the lack of affordable housing is one of the big uh, legacies of our corporate Democrats who have wanted to build nothing but luxury housing. Um, there are some other important measures on the ballot. There's one to change the business tax so that it would go more on the corporations and less on the small businesses and other ones having to do with evictions and so on. Basically, we're in a situation where we have a city with many, many, many people with very progressive politics, but we do not have the organization that the, the developers are able to pay, pay for. We have to have organizations that we create without as much money as they have. And we do have networks and we have a lot of work and we need a stronger network and much more organizing than we've done thus far in order to be in, in a position where we can beat them. We win sometimes. We got Ron Dellum elected mayor, although he was also opposed by the corporate Democrats. Um, we've gotten other progressive mayors, so we win. 
quite a bit of the time, but it's gotten harder because there is so much concentration on trying to take over Oakland, close our schools, create privatized schools that are more appealing to more affluent people and uh, develop only high-end housing, which none of us can afford. Already the black community has been forced out of the city, not entirely, but in large numbers. So um, that's what we're up to. Thank you very much. Nice talking with you. Thank you very much. Oh, man, that's a real struggle. You just broke it down right there. Um, let's see. Um, I think um, we're going to open it up now for a Q&A. And uh, let's see. Um, we're encouraging you to turn on your camera so that we can spotlight you when you ask your question. Um, we also at this time want to announce um, that in addition to our panelists, we have um, Melinda Levon present on our call today, uh, who is a leader um, in the recent victory over the anti-abortion amendment in Kansas um, and a panelist in our previous dialogue. Uh, so she'll be available to answer um, questions as well. Did you want to say um, maybe two minutes, um, uh, Ms. Levon, and then we'll open it up for questions and you can continue to engage with the rest as the rest of the panelists do. I don't know, if, is she still here? She was here earlier. Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to say something. Um, uh, I worry about my signal, so if I get cut off, please just move on. Um, but uh, we're still working really hard here in Kansas to defeat two constitutional amendments in November. We've had a great time talking to our comrades lately as they work protecting and another outreach um, to, to fight their yeah, they are fighting an amendment. Don't forget to think about them. Okay, um, thank you. Our connection's not very good. Our, we, we're not hearing you very well. Um, so maybe as your signal gets better, you can join in uh, as part of the Q&A. Um, and with that, I wanna encourage folks to um, raise your hand if you know how to do that in the Zoom or put a question in the chat. Um, Mac and I will together try to field questions um, Mac, do you see any questions in the chat that we should? Yeah, I did see one, but I saw their hand raised as well. And I think I just want to name that if we can encourage folks to ask one question. Um, and uh, it's not, I, I don't want to like discourage dialogue back and forth but because we want to make space for everybody else. Uh, I think after the question has been asked, we can move on to the next person. Uh, so I did see Kenneth and uh, they have two names. Oh, it's Kathy and Chris Ben. Okay. They also put a question in the chat. All right, Kathy, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yeah, hi. Great to be here uh, with you all. It's wonderful. Uh, the question is um, for Ken, what role do you see compromise play in your campaign or other Los Angeles campaigns? And do you see this as a leap in political sophistication? And what role do you see in the development of a nationwide revolutionary organization? Thanks. So unfortunately, Kenneth had to leave for another event. Okay. So would you like to ask that question to somebody else or ask it? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, um, 
Uh, how about Angelica Duenos? If she's there. Oh. Oh, I don't see her. Well, if someone would like to tackle it. <laughs> Not in the meeting anymore. Yeah, it looks like um, some of our panelists um uh, have logged off kenneth we knew he had to leave and helica was saying she wasn't feeling well um so we can open it up to yeah. um the other panelists can you uh repeat the question yeah, what role do you see compromise playing in your campaign or campaigns um, do you see this as a leap in political sophistication? And what role do you see in the development of a nationwide revolutionary organization? Um, I think, of course, if you're going to be involved politically, you find that you have to compromise on some things. For example, the slate of people that we've put together that we support for the mayor's position are good people, um, but there are some issues that I would have liked them to take a stronger position on and they think they couldn't get elected if they did that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I being a kind of uncompromising person decided that we really needed to defeat the, the developer candidates and so it was worthwhile supporting them, although there were some positions that I, I really thought were not, not that good. On the other hand, I think we as people who have a political and economic analysis need to keep saying what we think and analyzing things according to what capitalism is doing to the country so it's it's a it's a fine line between compromising tactically in order to support somebody you may disagree with to some extent and continuing to put out an analysis that helps people to develop in a better direction so I think that's a fine line, but I think that's what we need to do. And that's what I work on and have to think about a lot of the time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, did you want to add something, Michael? Um, no, nothing of particular insight. The, the nature of the campaign that I'm on is not um, uh, an effort to to elect a representative or, or a person. So um, where we see, I guess you could think of compromise in a certain way, um, there is a large coalition of folks um, that are mobilizing um, to, to vote no. And that can be, you know, a wide range of organizations that, that don't agree on um, a lot of things, right? Or may have strategic disagreements, may have tactical disagreements, may have just different politics um, in general, right? Um, so part of the, part of the compromising you do is um, you welcome everybody in on on this this issue with a very clear and direct ask of let's get out the vote for for voting no um, and and our substantive political differences um, and things like that they're they're important they matter um, and in in this moment on on this effort um, we can unite under this this particular objective. I think a, a follow up question in the chat um, for you, Michael, is um, are you organizing across states? Um, how are you connecting up? I think, so, you know, even just through, you know, communication, someone says, have you had communication with people uh, in Kansas, for example? Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so I've been an organizer, an issue-based organizer for, for a long time, um, fighting for the basic needs of Appalachians. Um, most of the, the cross-state work that, that we've been a part of have been focused particularly on the U.S. South, um, U.S. Southeast around here, I like to talk about. Like if, you, if you've got a, a team in the SEC conference, um, we're probably talking about that area. Um, but um, 
folks within our organization have reached out to other other folks um, within the coalition. Obviously, there's there's folks that have been in conversations with folks from the Can Kansas campaign, which has given given us a lot of hope that the uh, for our campaign as well. Um, my particular lane has been focused on coordinating um, with other uh, working class white guys who are organizers as well for fighting for our basic needs and then mobilizing those folks across um, rural areas and, and especially the South, but beyond that, um, to support our local base building efforts to, to talk about our basic needs in an expansive way and recruit more working class white guys into joining, joining the fight for, for shared struggle and shared freedom. Um, I think I have one for Michael and then I'll come back to one with Kitty. Um, just because you are talking about the rural areas and then we're talking about the South, you know, the American right to vote and even the right to have our vote counted is under attack. And we're wondering how you're seeing this affect your campaigns in your areas, um, in your neighboring um, areas, and how y'all are working to address that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for the folks who were on the call while we were in the waiting room watching videos and stuff, there was um, discussion about um, felony disenfranchisement um, in Florida. Um, and it was mentioned that Kentucky as well is one of the strictest places in the entire nation for felony disenfranchisement. Um, so that just means that if somebody is convicted of a felony in the state of Kentucky, um, you you lose your right to vote unless um, it is uh, reinstated by by the governor. Um, so recently, with our with our new governor, there was an expanded push to re-enfranchise um, over two hundred thousand Kentuckians who have a felony conviction in their past. Felony convictions, the way that racist policing works, obviously falls heavily on black and and brown Kentuckians. Um, but a lot of those folks who who had their right to vote restored have not known that, um, or they're still not familiar with with the process of doing that. So in our efforts that's showing up, um, talking to folks and, and explaining how the process works of, of confirming whether your voting rights have, have been restored, whether you're eligible to vote, how to, how to request, um, submit a request for, for having your voting rights reinstated. So that's been like a big part of how we talk to voters, not just like, will you vote, can you vote, and all of that stuff, but also just sharing information about voting rights in Kentucky um, is a huge part of it. And and we know that that's a, a, a strategic ploy, limiting um, access to the ballot, limiting access to participation in, in any democratic procedures um, is to disempower um, the the working class from having a voice in, in Kentucky politics and Southern politics in general. Um, so uh, that that's a huge part of, of how we have to understand what we're doing in struggle. We are not merely trying to win, uh, stopping a bad constitutional amendment. We're engaging in the effort to stop that bad constitutional amendment in a way to build a base of um, uh, working class folks who are ready to say, I've had enough of this. I deserve dignity. I deserve respect. Our communities are valuable and we're going to be uh, in uh, stepping our feet into long term struggle um, among folks who might have never thought about doing that kind of thing before over our basic needs like healthcare, housing, voting. Um, all of these things are basic needs because they're part of our basic dignity as people. Thanks. This your Kitty, and then both of you can uh, kind of speak to this next question in the chat. But um, I've been involved in housing, homelessness, and tenant issues. What are some of the real solutions to America's housing crisis? And how does the fight for housing fit into a larger battle for democracy? And then both of you can speak to the importance of the growing opportunity to build unity in organizing for extremely low income housing and social housing model in the local housing initiatives. And a reminder, if people have questions, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. So there have been a few uh, important uh, developments in Oakland that I think address this issue. One is the ballot measure that I mentioned 
which uh, this is a California wide issue that cities are not for segregationist reasons, cities are not allowed to pay for and build affordable housing, according to the California Constitution. So the only way you can do it is you have to put a ballot measure on your ballot to say that you want to build housing. I think those ballot measures will win now because there's the housing problem is so obvious. But this, the reason the cities, I mean, I always wondered about this. Carol Fife looked up the stuff and figured it out. And so she put it on the ballot. I always wondered why doesn't the city just do it? But they can't do it. And so this is important because it would allow us to have 13,000 units. Land trusts are very important. Um, are the indigenous people of Oakland just got a chunk of land which returned to them uh, by a, through a land trust. So that's a very important mechanism. I think the activist kind of things that the Moms for Housing did, which is, you know, this company had 200 vacant houses, which they were just holding. And so the Moms for Housing took over one of them, lived in it, and the sheriff showed up with a tank and a battering ram. Imagine this in, in Oakland. The sheriff shows up with a tank and a battering ram to remove a couple mothers and their kids. And the site was so ugly that along with some other horrible stuff he did, he was just defeated in the election for sheriff. This racist dog who's been a sheriff for many, many years in Alameda County lost his election. And part of the reason was the image of him uh, with the battering ram and the, so, so that, and what they ended up doing was they won. Uh, the company finally was so embarrassed by how many sites they held empty that they had to turn over, they, they made an agreement with the family, so the families now live there. So it was a huge victory. So I think there are a lot of electoral things that need to happen, and there are also some direct action things that need to happen because the housing situation in Oakland in particular is so bad that people support direct action. And actually there was no criticism of what the Moms for Housing did of any significant import. Um, the other thing is another ballot, ballot battle that Carol Fife has been involved in is do the homeless encampments get to keep their spaces or be moved to something that's better than where they are, or do they continue to just be, you know, uh, beat up on by the police who take their stuff and throw it away. And that's a huge battle too. And that's going on in the city council, but there have been some victories uh, on that also. So. Great, uh, thank you for that. Um, let's see, are there any other questions in the chat that we should address? I do see uh, that folks could speak to the, uh, the importance mm -hmm. of the growing opportunity to build unity, like the like civic organizing for extremely low income housing and social housing models for both of you. But then also, Michael, somebody asked, how does the lead support your work? Um, the first question was something about social housing. I'm sorry. I, was I, to speak, I, no, you're perfect. Was to speak to the importance of the growing opportunity to build unity. Um, and that includes the organizing for extremely low income housing and the social mm -hmm. housing model. Yeah. Um, so I can I can talk about building um, unity and 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 why that matters in in a place like Kentucky. Um, Kentucky is an overwhelmingly majority white state, um, and it is an incredibly poor state as well. Um, Eighty seven percent of Kentuckians are white, um, and uh, that that's a lot, right? Um, and uh, folks from the historically black um, neighborhoods in, in Louisville, Kentucky, um, people of color uh, communities um, in rural Kentucky, um, and white folks um, in, in poor neighborhoods in, in our cities and, and in rural areas. Um, tons of all of those folks um, are not are not able to meet our basic needs due to um, generational poverty and an economy that has extracted wealth from all of us um, and, and stolen that. Um, 
the only prospect that we have of winning in Kentucky is a multiracial working class alliance of, of folks coming together to fight for our basic needs. Um, if if uh, there were enough people of color in Kentucky um, to win that on on um, you know their own right um, through through exclusive black or exclusive people of color organizing, um, that would have already happened, right? Uh, uh, and and it hasn't. If there were enough white folks, poor working class white folks, to to win those basic needs that we all deserve on our own, that would have already happened. Um, and and it hasn't yet. So um, we only have the numbers that we need. And this is this kind of sounds like self interest, right? And, and that's because it is. We only have the numbers that we need um, to win our basic needs when we build in, in uh, solidarity and in struggle and alliance together across our differences of race, gender, um, and those kind of things. The way that we approach that in Kentucky is, is connecting um, across geographies. So uh, rural Kentucky housing campaigns, connecting with urban Kentucky housing campaigns. Um, across uh, across race and gender lines to say that um, look we all deserve better than what than what we're offered um, and the reason that what we're offered is crap is because of the historic legacy of divide and conquer that especially uses racism but doesn't only uh, use racism to to divide us. We'll use any any mechanism that they can exploit in order to divide us. So we have to be strong and fight against that, which means we have to um, join in solidarity because we've got everything to win. Um, uh, if if we fight alongside each other um, and everything for folks like me who grew up in Appalachia like I did, um, everything that we want for ourselves, for our families, and for our futures also lies on the other side of freedom for Black Kentuckians. Um, I think in some ways, white people in the United States have lost their minds. Uh, it, you know, some of the things that you see people opposing for ridiculous reasons uh, seem to indicate that there are some people who would prefer not to have freedom and services for themselves, they would rather have racist things happen to other people. And I think that's just a reality. I'm, I'm hoping and thinking they're not a majority, but they definitely exist. Um, and I think part of a very important part in Oakland, something that's happened lately, and I think probably to some extent around the rest of the country also, is that white people have started talking about racism against black and brown people. And, you know, I've been in the movement for a long time. There was a period when that was very unusual. No, white people didn't bring up racism. But in Oakland now, a lot of times white people do bring up racism and they will call something out as being a racist policy or a racist event or whatever. And that's very helpful because I think otherwise people of color had no have no confidence in us we can say we're on the same side, but if we're not willing to call out what obviously exists, then are we really on the same side? So I think that's very important. And actually I, I teach was one of the things I do. And that's one of the most important things I talk with people in my classes about people who are gonna be teachers. You need to talk about racism yourself. And there's kind of an inclination for whites to think that's something for other people to bring up and then we might chime in, but it doesn't have to be. Some things are really clear. So I think that's, a critical aspect of building unity. Um, in Oakland, there is a lot of unity in a lot of ways, uh, partly I think for the reason I just said. Um, and on the housing issue and the homelessness issue, there's definitely a lot of unanimity. Unfortunately, for some people, their opposition to homelessness becomes because they don't want to have to deal with it. They don't want to have to see the 5,000 people who are living on the streets. But Anyway, there's enormous opposition to homelessness and the uh, mayor, the current mayor is pretty unpopular because she has done nothing about it. Um, and so the city has built no housing and she basically has had a mean attitude toward homelessness in my opinion. So, um, so I think it is an issue that can unite people um, and, um, and at least in Oakland, it's the most important issue, the polls show. Uh, for everyone.
Thank you so much, everybody. I think um, we're going to take one more question, and then we're going to move on to the next part of our program. Um, it says, Kitty, are you able to t share a bit about the values as stated in the progressive mm -hmm. slate? And could you speak a little bit about the rank choice process? And then we're going to move on. Okay, and can you tell me the first part again? Yes. Are you able to share a bit about the values as stated in the progressive slate? And could you speak a little bit about the ranked choice process? Yeah. So let me let me start with the ranked choice voting. Um, if you can get it in your community, I think it's a very good thing. Um, the, the clearly progressive thing about it is that it prevents candidates from having to run a second campaign. And that is something which is beneficial to candidates who have less money. So because the run, runoff, it's called instant runoff sometimes, the runoff takes place during the first election, um, it means that the candidate can spend all their money on the first election. And they, if they have less money than the other candidates, um, that's very helpful. Um, and uh, we need to do something about the fact that they're able to spend unlimited amounts of money in it, it that this is an important, if we're gonna do anything about elections, we need to stop the possibility of these millions of dollars in independent expenditures. So um, that's how ranked choice voting works. Um, so you get to, you know, you get to rank, if there are three people you consider progressive, you rank them on your ballot and the votes of maybe when, when one of them gets wiped out, the votes go to another candidate that's also progressive. Um, so it's a little complicated for people to learn and people say, I don't like it, it's too complicated, but it does provide more uh, possibility, I think, for progressive uh, candidates. Um, in the case of these candidates, uh, they all, even in the mayor's race, they all oppose school closings. They all support uh, uh, many more measures on housing and they have some creative ideas about housing and dealing with homelessness. Um, they have a record, uh, the candidate who's on the city council has a record of being part of four council members who have brought about some very progressive legislation in the city. Um, they are, um, they are not, their, their position is kind of, they are not working for the developers, they're working for the people. So um, they have support from, you know, the, the progressive democratic clubs, a lot of the unions, there is a very right-wing section of the unions who in Oakland who have an unwarranted, an, an, an unpleasant amount of power, that's the construction trades. Sorry? And oh, somebody uh, put in the chat what what the uh, values are. Um, so, um, and I guess I would say if we're if we're going to encapsulate it in one sentence, it has to do with wanting an open that the current residents can live in happily, not a, a not a city where the current residents are being pushed out in favor of bringing in more affluent people, which is what's going on now. I think that summarizes the values in, in a lot of ways. What do the people who live here now need, not what will be good for the developers? Thank you. Um, so we will come back to, uh, in a little bit for, some, for a little bit uh, more questions, but next I would actually like to bring up and introduce Greg Pond, another poet from San Francisco, who will give us another gift. So come on up, Greg. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Deep part of the forest. We're in the deep part of the forest where the trees don't sleep. They stretch, they creep, they crawl, then leap and claw. We keep moving fast and don't stop to react while getting scraped and scratched by the branches of dying trees, the dying trees of democracy. 
that leaves its cuts and scars on the stripes and stars and across the hearts of you and me? How do we find our way through this thicket of greed and green that blocks our good and keeps us from getting through these woods of dried and dying trees? Is there a way for these United States not to be a haven for fear and hate, but a place to embrace love and liberty? Or does, or does such a place only exist outside the forest of my dreams? Freedom. Where does freedom hide? Is it under the robe of justice, never to see the light? Where does freedom fly? Is it beneath the flag of slavery or veil of genocide? Where does freedom shine? Is it behind the cloak of liberty where no one can know its strife? Where does freedom cry? Is it into the tissue of tyranny where hopes and dreams have died? How does freedom survive? By finding its way into the hearts of those willing to keep hope alive. I, I apologize for the uh, background noise here. Got a, Final okay. call. When hope has left the gate, it gets replaced by fear and hate. The love we were given has been lost since we've been living in this culture of violence and rape. Proposals for control like suggestions for change silently fall on the deafest ears and bites the dust that thickens on shelves during midterm election years. When our feelings reel from madness to sadness to glad it wasn't us, then something's, then something's gotta be done. Annihilation awaits any nation that loves its guns more than its sons, loves its daughters just a little bit less, and its neighbors, not much at all. A generation will be left to fend for itself if a country ignores the final call. Black like me. I'm sorry. Um, I'll just do one more. I'll just do one more. Um, I, I apologize They're doing the Indianapolis 500 here in my block. So um, this is new ism. When right nor left quite represent people's concerns or primary interests, and all we ever get is left, right, back where we began, then we need better decisions. We need a brand new brand. We need a brand new ism. We need another other to free us from the prison that incarcerates us all. We need a social call, perhaps a call for social ism or some sort of government which will lift us if we fall too far into the schism that has always existed between the who is and the who isn't. One that throws a comforter over those with less than, feeds the haven't eaten, beds the can't find sleep, and cares for the who needs healing. A commune, a communal, maybe a communistic tribunal, a mass community, community gathering, no slow or middle of the road to fascism, but a worldwide revolution, a true planetarianism towards a new humanitarianism, 
united to combat fear and greed, whose primary mission is to house and feed, to spread no hatred or disease, and create a planet where we all will be global promoters of love and peace. Thank you all. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Greg. I would like to just name that Greg is a member of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade and Queer Rebels, and also facilitates a weekly call in, and a radio program called Politically Speaking. So you could definitely hear some more truth of power there. I think I'm now going to spend a couple of moments speaking on challenging the structure of our current democracy and what real democracy would look like. I think that conversation starts with what it isn't, right? Um, what real democracy looks like is something that we have never seen before. It's like explaining the fourth dimension to the third. We have never experienced liberation. We have never experienced real democracy. And so I wanna start by talking about what democracy is not. Our current democracy system is working exactly as it was built to do. It was a system built upon private property and contractual agreements for white men. It is working exactly as it is supposed to, to disenfranchise and not allow for anyone else's participation except for the rich. It is a space that is making daily decisions for our daily lives, whether your city council meets once a week, your board of supervisors meets every two weeks, or your state representatives meet more or less frequently. In these spaces, they do not make a way for our most vulnerable populations to have a voice. My unhoused neighbor cannot go into my city or my county councils because they don't even have storage for their things, for their carts, for their dogs. It, they require you to be able to pay and be able to afford for your, except for your participation in this democracy, whether that is your ability to have transportation to get there, have the internet or the phone to be able to call in if that option is even given, the amount of hours to give our expertise unpaid to sit in those rooms for hours at times that we are often at work. They're stripping our rights, our voting rights away, and they did it intentionally to focus on people of color through the war on drugs and the racist mandatory sentencing double downs. They have ensured that people in this community cannot have access to their democracy. And therefore, we have to begin to dream of what democracy looks like for us. Because I know it is not inside of the city council Board of Supervisors or state legislator walls because they don't even have enough room for the people who need to be inside of them to speak. They don't even have enough space for this community to enter those rooms. Therefore, they are not the place for us to continue to work towards. We should be inside of these spaces demanding and attacking the ways in which they allow for our participation in our democracy, because it is the very thing that we are defending ourselves from. What a new way looks like is organizing ourselves on a community and a neighborhood level. You have many versions of this throughout the country referred to as neighborhood councils, where our neighbors are talking to each other and deciding not just what what politics we wanna see and what needs our community has. But at some point we'll get into a conversation of what food are we going to grow? Who can watch our kids? Who wants to teach our kids? What park are we gonna to use to hold our own city council meeting? Because when enough of us are in that park and not inside of that city council space, guess where the power is? In the park. We are absolutely going to have to reimagine the fact that we get our agendas just four days before the city council meeting and only four days to respond to all of the, excuse my language, but bullshit that is on it. We have to come up with new ways to make sure that my neighbors who live in the tents across the street have their stories and voices brought into these spaces. 
And then we have to create the spaces that will actually hold the work to change what is happening. We have to decide for ourselves, what does meaningful engagement and participation of our community look like? And when we begin to center the most vulnerable people, the folks who do not have their voices um, listened to, unhoused neighbors, people um, uh, with the intersection of incarceration who have had their rights stolen, people who are living so poor that they can't, I mean, we know that we get time off to go and vote, but employers are not making sure that those workers know that, right? People are working two or three jobs on voting day. People who don't even have the time to read the ballot measure, right? How do we get to those folks and center those voices? Because I'll tell you, those are the experts of the real reasons and the real harms that are caused by such a system that was built for white men and their collection of us and things as property. And until we begin to do that, we are gonna continuously be responding to these things. It is great that we are running candidates. It is great that we are going into these spaces to take our power back. But the, what we need to be doing once we are in those spaces is dismantling the power structure as it stands and begin to dismantle the things that they use every single day to make those decisions without us in the room, without our most vulnerable people in the room. What good is it to take these seats if we are only going to continue to use the master's tools to continue the harm, to continue to uphold and legitimize their structures. When we sit inside of these spaces, we need to come up with ways to make the parking free. We need to come up with ways to make sure that we are engaging in such an intentional form of community engagement and participation that it forces them to slow down their decision making. They should not be allowed to make decisions like this every week or every two weeks without intentional community engagement and participation. We should not allow these things to happen until this community has been heard. We are the experts. We are the ones suffering from these crises. We are the ones in these gentrified neighborhoods. We are the ones who are dying at the hands of law enforcement. We are the ones who are dying because of our lack of access to health care and our la and we are the ones who they are making sure doesn't have access to education. So that way we do not have the knowledge and the power to fight back. So once we're in these spaces, like I said, we have to reimagine, we have to fight for the transformation of the ways in which we make these decisions and the ways in which we allow for our public, our experts to be involved. And we have to encourage that everybody be willing to go knock on the doors in their streets and build neighborhood councils where we can talk about and engage in forms of political and popular education, where we can get together and strategize on the path forward. Like I said, it's, it's not just for our votes, but it's for our very survival. And I hope I'm inspiring you today to begin to think of those things to begin to dream for your community. What meaningful engagement and public participation in, this, in a democracy, because this democracy is working exactly like it was supposed to, for white men to collect us and things as property. I'm now gonna tone it down <laughs> um, and bring us back for some further questions and dialogues uh, we are going to wrap up our questions at about in about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll close it down, okay? So I think I remember seeing a hand that was up. Let me go back to my participation. Thank you, Gloria. Oh, it was actually Gloria. I remember this name. Okay. Thank you. You know, I just wanted to share a little bit about what's going on in our community. Uh, actually, there's um, a, a certain alliance between uh, the uh, firefighters and police. Uh, there's a measure that doesn't expire for four years, but yet they wanted to put it on the ballot this November. The thing is that there's such mud, mud slang, what is it, mud that um, there's a, a lot of 
lawn signs being torn, uh, being taken away, removed. Um, there's even um, actually because the, the firefighters and police belong to uh, unions, they're being supported by the unions against the community. And also um, one particular young man that um, has been presenting his issues at the city council is being attacked for being anti-police um, and you know, not, not uh, you know, for people not to support him. Uh, the one other thing recently, we found out that's probably about 4,000 ballots uh, were sent to the wrong people. In other words, that looks like our registrar of, uh, of uh, voters um, actually used an old district lines for the city council districts. Uh, right now, the board of supervisors have supposedly hired uh, an independent auditor to figure that out, but this is a big mess here. But the one thing is, you know, the measure on the ballot, I think police and firefighters are trying to ensure their jobs through that measure and never mind. In fact, um, there was one young man that has died in custody. And so they're, you know, looking into that now. He's only 21 years old. They don't have any idea what happened to him at this time. They're not saying we've had our pedestrians run over by the police themselves. So it's, uh, you know, it might be an accident but there's nothing, they just hope that the public will forget about it. But we have a lot of work to do in this community and you know we're, we're not allowing certain things to roll the way they're used to. And uh, you know, affordable housing is another issue. Uh, I'm interested in knowing how to get a hold of Kitty because she mentioned that about uh, affordable housing being on the ballot. And you know, right now, I think it's only the Oakland ballot, but I, I'd like to see if I can speak more to her about that because we don't have it on our ballot. Okay, thank you. I'm putting my email in the chat. I see Ethel. You're, you're, you're on mute, uh, Mac. Yeah, I see Ethel. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I There was background noise and I was um, wanting to make sure that Gloria knew that in the chat, we dropped the actual uh, language about the progressive um, slate um, and the measures that Kitty has been speaking to, which are extraordinary. Um, we're hoping that people think about them in the kind of way that Mac was talking about, work in the, in the immediate sense, but keeping that vision, that big vision about the, the, the kind of society that we need and wanna work towards. But those measures are, are, have three parts to them. And one part of them is to actually strengthen renters um, uh, rights, including uh, brothers and sisters who now um, their homes are their RVs. And at this time, they have no protections whatsoever. When they move encampments, obviously, brothers and sisters who live in RVs are, are tossed around and moved from block to block as well. And these measures would strengthen it. I think something that Sister Kitty uh, inferred uh, but I would think needs to be, you know, highlighted as well. We know if we're in a battle against the hedge funds, this is big real estate, big finance that has built these these huge skyscrapers. And um, you know, just because these measures are on our ballot doesn't mean they're going to pass. And it was one of the reasons that we thought it was important from the um, electoral task force, basic needs electoral task force, to have some from Oakland and Kitty did a fine job of drawing the interlocking connections between the battle for education and the battle for housing. But um, we're gonna have to fight for this. I'm not certain that a lot of people in our city even are aware that 13,000 units of extremely low income housing. They always lie when they give the developers, when the developers come and say, oh, give us tax breaks. We'll make a hundred units for affordable housing. And that, of course, means everybody that's on the call, because if you make $80,000 a year, you're certainly that's affordable housing. 
average person in Oakland maybe makes 30, 35,000. So they're, you know, they're all left out. So I think there's a lot of different components and we do want people to really please go over to our city. Um, uh, um, Kitty, tell me if I'm wrong, but they should be able to go over to um, our, um, our, either our vote registrar or our city uh, component to see this, but also go directly over to Carol Fife. That's our councilwoman, Carol Fife, and I'll put her name and, and stuff in here, but it's about movement building. And that's the other thing that all of the speakers have again referenced. And I think we wanna build on that because they, I think uh, Michael from Kentucky really spoke to that in, in great concept. So just wanting to touch base on those. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on what Ethel just said with a couple of things. Um, one thing is people get stuck when they get in a position to talk or negotiate with the developers. They agree to something called a community benefits agreement. Community benefits agreements were dreamed up by the, the developers. We didn't think of those. This is our community. Why do we need to have a community benefit agreement to have, negotiate with somebody who has nothing to do with our community about why we should get some little tidbits? And a lot of the nonprofits and unfortunately the construction unions go along with this and say, well, if we get good enough community benefits, we should let them build. No, the community benefit is to leave our community as it is, unless you're gonna build affordable housing. Leave us alone. We have a community, it's benefiting us fine. We don't wanna be moved out by your new housing. So I think it's really important for us to challenge this and it's not challenged enough. The other thing is the construction trades are very racist. They have in Oakland, uh, because of their membership limitations, the amount of tax funded uh, construction work, tax funded construction work that goes to black workers is 9% in a population that is 25% black. And this has been for decades. And it's because the construction trades also unfortunately are not really unions, they're actually fraternities and they let people in according to their own choices. And people don't wanna criticize them because they're called unions. And they also intimidate people and they ran somebody out of office because she wouldn't do everything they said, but they are really anti-progressive and they need to be called out because, because they're called unions, people think that they should go along with whatever they're supporting. And, but they're just supporting what the developers are. They want the jobs for their members. So whatever horrible thing some developer wants to build, they support it. And I'm sorry if, if anyone feels offended by this critique of the, but they are, they are very bad. I mean, of course, most of the unions are wonderful. The teachers union, the ILWU, the SEIU, I mean, they're wonderful unions, but those, those are not among them. And also if people want to talk more about the housing thing, I did put my email there. I could show you, like I could, you know, link you to Carol, some of the articles and her Carol Fife's uh, office. It'd be good to have her speak to something. I mean, she's done an amazing amount of stuff. She worked for ACE for a while before she ran for office and ACE does really good housing work. So, um, so there's, yeah, there is a lot to learn from Oakland. Oh, you know, we're in a terrible situation, but there's a lot to learn from what we've been through and what we're pursuing. Just so you know, Kitty, um, Carol has actually addressed our dialogues, um, in the past, she's been one of our featured speakers, absolutely. And um, when she first uh, got elected into office, oh, you got to know it. We needed that. Um, but you know, it's very hard as an elected official who's kicking butt on multiple levels. Her, uh, you should go to and, and visit her district. I'll say this to the other. I know you do, Kitty, but uh, others on the audience because I think again, it really shows what Angelica was speaking to, having a people's candidate who was running to. Um, define and carry out the business of the people, not the business of, of, of businesses who make money on us. Thank you all for that. And thank you for your questions and participation. Um, we're going to be posting two or three evaluation questions in the chat. And we so appreciate that people give your feedback. Um, if you can stay on the line to the program, or if you want to stay on the line at the end to get ver verbal feedback to folks, uh, that would be appreciated too. But if you could fill out this form, it would be very helpful and we'll continue to inform our work as we continue. 
As we close this program, uh, I would like to bring back Maria Elena Martinez to summarize key lessons we learned from the dialogue, the role of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America as part of the movement, and discuss a few next steps for the movement. Yeah, thanks, Mac, and thank to everyone who um, was here to contribute. The poets were just amazing, just incredible. So I want to give a special thank you to the artists who, without whom we couldn't have a movement. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, you know, sum up some of the things and maybe tie some things together. Um, one of the ideas that stood out the most to me um, was in. Uh, was evident from all of the um, reports, right? From the, the battlegrounds, right? This, from the struggles. Um, and so the details and um, the ways in which they're maneuvering and winning, winning and compromising and uniting and having these courageous conversations. Um, but what stood out to one of the things that stood out to me um, when Michael said that these battles are like schools for revolutionaries, you know, that it's in these um, struggles and these campaigns that revolutionaries are learning. We're learning to connect with each other. We're learning to uh, build with each other, um, you know, and so um, and so we're seeing these examples of new organizations, new, you know, interracial struggles, um, you know, courageous conversations, like things that have said, like, you know, whites are talking about race, you know, um, that's new uh, in some ways, not, you know, I teach history, so we can't say things like that and kind of, but, but it is new, right? It is newer um, in new ways. Um, and so I just wanted to add a little bit, I guess, more of kind of tying these things together that, you know, this fight for basic needs, uh, it, there's a reason for it, right? It's a response to the joblessness caused by automation and globalization, that the middle class has lost ground to the point where three people own the wealth of what is it, the bottom 40%? How did Ernie, Bernie say it? One, two, three, three people you know, have amassed this wealth. So, you know, these movements aren't just because, you know, people have done the work or the ideas are there, which is yes, now we need the work and the ideas more than ever. But the reality is that this society is, is being torn apart. Um, and that's why these courageous conversations are happening. That's why people are finding themselves and finding each other in order to struggle for these basic needs. Um, and so I just wanted to end, you know, that this, um, this growing movement is happening because people are being abandoned because the corporations are and have taken over our government. And so what did you hear today? You heard that we need to vote. You need to run for office. You need to hit the streets. You need to build a movement. And almost everyone here is already doing some or all of that. And that is great. And so we, you know, today we're able to inspire each other to join something, read something, share something. Yes, all of that. Um, and so I just want to encourage us, you know, to um, continue to share our struggle. Um, and I think maybe just a little bit on uh, the abolitionist movement that was active for, you know, over 100 years before legal slavery was actually abolished. It had courageous and committed abolitionists from the beginning. Um, and yet it still didn't end slavery, right, for 100 plus years. Um, so it wasn't until a broad political force was able to unite to make it end. Lincoln's Republican Party finally united decades of failed parties into an emancipatory party or a party that had the, the possibility of pushing uh, this, this forward finally. So what was the basis for that unity? It wasn't just the moral imperative or the desire for racial justice, which of course was there, it was just much more complex and messier than that. And so this economic transformation um, that we're experiencing right now is really what is making possible and necessary 
these social and political transformations that we are coming around to because we have to. Um, and so just to kind of try to connect some of those dots um, that, you know, where it appears that society is in decay, that institution and institutions are failing all over the place, that this is a sign that, a, that this is a chance for big change, that we need to think broadly and more radical in order to stabilize the system because the old foundation is giving way. There is nobody can argue that this foundation for this society is giving way. Um, so, you know, those that are trying to stabilize it by going backwards, that's not going to work, right? Um, and so, just to uh, echo, I think what Mac was saying, that beautiful vision she laid out that we need to chart a new course, we need to move forward. And how do we do that? No generation in history has had this responsibility or this opportunity. This is relatively new. We need to talk about it. We need to wrestle with it. And that is why so many organizations uh, are forming today. We're trying to understand it. And the League of Revolutionaries for New America is a place to learn, to share, to discuss, and to fight for our class. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for everything that you're doing and that you know together we're gonna win this thing. Thank you again for showing up today. I'm a dynamite panelist from California and Kentucky. We hope to see you at the next lead dialogue for revolutionaries on uh, November 19th. That's and we're calling that one Revolution at the Ballot Box. You can please look at the website at learna.org. That's L R N A.org for listings of the other upcoming events. Sponsored, sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And I think I just want to name that there are, we just said it, y'all, there are revolutionary organizations across this nation. And it's just a matter of connecting ourselves. So please stay on the line if you'd like to talk to us further right now about this dialogue and next steps. We're going to end our recording.